So I just wanted to let people know we're recording and I'm going to do what I did the other day, which was I, I shared this um, afterwards on on uh, YouTube and I shared it on um, on the website and on Facebook and everywhere else. So um, I, I it was a little too complicated for me the other day to keep up with the chat. So I'm going to stick with answering questions with people who have who can be on camera and ask a question personally. Um, and then again, I'm kind of newish to Zoom. So um, raise your hand. I think there's a little raise your hand thing and I, I'll try and make sure I get the people who raised their hand with a question. Um, and let's see, that's 11 people. I'm gonna count the people as we let them in because I didn't count last time. I think we had about 40. Hi, Sarah, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> Um, I owe you a call. Ah. <laughs> anyway, so this is Tamara Rubin, Let's Save Mama, Let's Save Mama.com, TamaraRubin.com. And I decided to do these little chats um, as a way to connect directly with people because I can't get to all the questions in writing at this point. I try. And I do have 3,500 posts and pages with, with writing, um, answering questions on the website. So make sure you look things up if you haven't yet. Um, if anybody has a question, let me know. Nobody's raised their hand um, yet here. So since nobody has raised their hand, I'm going to answer a question that I didn't answer the last time. Uh, one of the women who chimed in asked about pottery and ceramics and stoneware in general. And I didn't get to answer that um, because I think she had a two-part question. I was focused on the asbestos in her ceiling. And the answer about pottery in general is that... Um, the glazes on any kind of pottery. It can be old pottery, new pottery. Uh, it can be pottery that's labeled as, as fine china, bone china, stoneware, um, ironware, all the different wares that, that can all have lead. The lead is primarily in the glazes, not in the actual uh, substrate. The substrate levels in ceramics that I've found generally are consistent across the board, um, usually not more than 200 parts per million and usually more likely 100 parts per million or lower, 40 parts per million, 50 parts per million. And the XRF instrumentation that I use tests the surface of anything it tests. So it very clearly is testing the glaze. And um, if the if the glaze is negative and if it's thick, then you won't read the substrate levels um, for the pottery piece that it's testing. So in general, I say avoid mass manufactured. If you have a potter in your life who hand makes pottery and you know what their um, ingredients are to their glazes, that's great. The one thing I've noticed pretty consistently across the board is that well, a lot of potters are doing a really good job of avoiding lead, not all of them know that they need to avoid cadmium. And I think there must be some thing in the glaze um, sales pitches that they get that says, oh, this cadmium's fine. It's, you'll, it's, a, it's okay to, this cadmium based glaze is okay to use on the exterior of a dish. So a lot of them are using these bright reds or oranges or purples on the outside of their mugs, for example. And I still think you should avoid those because cadmium causes cancer and you know, if you do buy from a local potter who uses a brightly colored glaze like that and isn't aware of the risk of cadmium, the risk is greater to that potter because when the glazes um, dry, they are in a dust form and they can have dust exposure to the cadmium in those glazes prior to firing. So it's a good thing to alert them. Okay, so we have a first question. Now, I don't know how to pronounce your name. It's Shan. Is it Shan? Is it like short? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so really specific question, but there's been a few, you've done a number of posts on leaded crystal, particularly Waterford crystal. Yes. So I have Waterford crystal in my house. That's never really used. I wanted to get rid of it in general, just to clear it out of my house, etc. It was inherited. Um, I have a baby at home, <laughs> etc. And you've shown, you had a couple of really good videos showing using wet wipes on how to get rid of dust, etc but it's behind a cabinet. I don't have a big place. It's by the kitchen. So I have huge concerns about moving it, um, creating dust that might cause more harm than just letting it be. And kind of, I know it's, it's an over under call, but I would hate to be like, I need this out of my house and then create a whole bunch of dust in the house. Um, you know, especially with a really, really little one, because they're so susceptible to thinking everything's calcium um, and then creating exposure that way, if that makes sense. 
Yeah. So I, um, I, I don't, it's not a whole bunch of dust. Number one, it's micro particulate dust. <laughs> and, and that's the concern, right? So, so when we're talking about, um, lead dust created from crystal, um, what, what I found is that if you have crystal that say you use on a regular basis, God forbid, and then you wash it on a regular basis, it won't test positive with the reactive agent swab because it's it, the little, the, the very micro particulate layer of dust that's on the surface is washed off every time you use it or it's rinsed into your drink. Um, so if it's just been sitting on a shelf like that, I would, you know, if it were me, I would probably go in there and wipe around the shelf and put a garbage bag right up to the shelf and dump everything right into the garbage bag you know, contractor, double thickness or trip, whatever the big black car garbage bags are. The other thing is, you know, I think Waterfield for still is a company, uh, uh, quote, let me know if I'm um, wrong about that, but if, if they're still an active company, you could um, gently, you know, put the, get a newspaper and wrap each of them up and put them in a box and try and return them and get, and get something else from that company that isn't leaded crystal. I think they make other things. So um, the other, the main point I would be, concerned about there is that don't get the lead free crystal because the lead free crystal has high levels of antimony. Um, they basically have replaced um, lead with antimony in a lot of applications. Hold on, I'm admitting one more person into the room here. This is number 12. Um, so, so lead free crystal is something to avoid. So don't exchange it for lead free crystal. Um, but if, you know, find out if there's a way to return it. And um, even if it's 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, you can still say, listen, this was given to me or, or I got this for my wedding, or this was from my grandmother's wedding or my mother's wedding. And we had no idea that this was toxic and we want something that's safe. And by doing that, you're more part of the movement in terms of um, letting the companies know that you're not okay with this. And a lot of them will give you a lot of flack back after that, because they'll say, oh no, that's not correct. You're, you're wrong. It doesn't have, um, uh, it's not, it's not unsafe, but, but because they've all been switching to lead free, you know, they must know internally that it is unsafe and they've read the science behind it. So if you, you have to decide, are you going to return it? And in which case you want to bag it and pack it up neatly. And then a box right then and there, you just don't want to bring it everywhere. And then, or if you're going to trash it, you know, wipe off your cabinet um, interior and, and throw it all in the trash and then wipe it off the cabinet interior again. It's not going to like create clouds of dust. It's, 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 um, micro particulate dust that's kind of adhered to the to the sides of the um of the crystal or or for example with that vase thing it was sitting like around the table tested positive around it so you know if you've got the thing closed like i said wipe the surface off first and then throw everything out um i mean i prefer to see these things thrown out so they aren't used by future generations so uh you know you have to make that call does that, does that help yeah, so the the over under on that just for the exposure. So I appreciate all the additional context about what to do after, right after you do the thing, um, but that the it won't create a bunch of dust that I don't have anyone else to to actually get rid of it if I'm nursing that it's going to spike my levels and get into. So oh, if you're yeah, nursing, I wouldn't do it yourself. I would definitely, or yeah, I would have somebody else do it since you're nursing. Yeah. If it's been okay. sitting, it's if it's been sitting in the cabinet and not been touched for you know months or years or longer, um, then it, then there is a, a concern for um, for you. So I would definitely, I mean, it's a hand to mouth concern. So if you wear gloves, put on a, a mask, and you know, and get rid and wipe wipe things down, you know, it's not not that significant. Um, I don't I don't want people paranoid about their homes, but. Um, it's definitely something to to clean up and, and handle carefully, especially if it's been sitting around a long time, because it's more likely to have uh, accumulated um, dust that's available. And you you, you know uh, an experiment you could do is get a lead check swab if you want to waste the money and and test some of the uh, crystal that's been sitting in your cabinet for months and months. If if there there is if it tests positive with lead check swab, then you can be pretty certain that it that there's a, a dust hazard around it as well. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank I'm, you so much. You're welcome. I think I'm letting in as this number 13. Let's see. And then um, I'm still getting the hang of this whole thing. Um, let's see. Does anybody else have a question? Let's see. You, uh, Sophia, do you know how to unmute yourself? Wait here. Uh, let's see. Ask to unmute there. 
Did you get a little request? Okay. Yes. Does that work? Yep. Okay. So um, I, I had a question. Um, my mom used to make uh, stained glass windows. And um, is that is that the case that I think I was reading that it, it the the lead from the window chalks and turns into dust? Yes. So even if they're just sitting there hanging, they would still get into the air and like my son could breathe it in and that yeah. could elevate his level because we had him tested recently and his level was um, 5.6. Oh, that's high. Yeah. And so I was looking around the house trying to figure out what was causing it. And then I realized that it could be the stained glass window. So I, I took all the windows down. Um, and we also had a, um, like a Tiffany lamp that he used to touch a lot. And so do you think that that was probably the main source or do you think that- Do you, do you live in a new construction home? No, I live in a duplex that was built in 1965. Okay, so that's relatively new. It's not like from the 1930s. I would say it's highly likely. I've worked with, I believe, three separate families whose kiddos had the primary source of poisoning be from the dust caused by um, stained glass. And uh, the the main thing is, had you not just 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 backtrack and I can't go back in time, but had you not already removed them, I would have definitely recommend putting them in a plastic bag right then and there. You know, not not bringing them across the room to a plastic bag if, if possible and wrapping them in plastic and taping them shut and, and put that away wherever you're going to put it until you decide what to do with it long term. Oftentimes when people have things like this that have sentimental value, I recommend you know storing it in your garage sealed up in a box until you like come to terms with whatever you need to come to terms with about whether or not you want to get rid of it or try and preserve it in a way that isn't hazardous. But these couple of families that I've worked with, these few families, they, their kiddos did have blood levels in the, I think, four to seven range consistently across the board. And um, the dust from one family, they had a like a, a window seat underneath the stained glass windows. Um, and the dust from the window seat, the interesting thing about a window seat cushion is that you don't clean it as often as you might other things because it's it's usually custom made to fit your window seat yeah. um, and it stays with the house like we have window seat cushions here at our house that have been here the 16 years we've lived here and they were put in by the previous owners so you know they they really can collect dust from leaded windows if there are window seat cushions that's how one of the kiddos was poisoned another of the kiddos was poisoned because there was um the, the home that they lived in was a renovated church and they got the unit with, it was a condo created out of a church and they got the unit with one of the large stained glass windows, which was along the stairs and the child used to run his hands along the windowsill um, as they were going up the stairs just out of habit and he was a finger sucker and he, he was poisoned. I believe that actually, that wasn't near Washington DC and I believe the case uh, study was drawn up about that, that situation after I uh, worked with that family. And so that was um, a, a, a definite concern. And so when you have, and then we, there was a family in the group. I, I can't remember who it was. I'm sure they're still in the group, but um, the mama had a, had a table where the edging was made of stained glass, like a coffee table and her kid uh -huh. was poisoned and, um, and he would eat his snacks off of the table. And that was a likely source. So if you're saying you had multiple stained glass art pieces, yes. Tiffany lamp, I'd say that's definitely enough to cause a blood level five. I mean, that's, I'm, a, this is, I'm not a doctor. This is an educated guest been doing this a while, but I think, um, especially in a 1965 house where you don't have like old lead painted wood windows, most likely usually in a 1965 house, you have, uh, aluminum windows. I don't know if you do. Mm -hmm. um, That's exactly right. Yeah. And you have um, a lot of times in, the, in a 1965 house, you, I can see from behind your head that looks like a, is that a window trim behind your head? Um, but yes. Usually there's thinner window trim and the thinner window trim isn't normally the kind that's been painted with lead paint. Um, there's a lot of indicators that um, the interior of a 1965 house is less likely to have lead. The exceptions to that are the kitchens, uh, bathrooms, and insides of closets. So if there's any deteriorating paint in kitchens, bathrooms, or insides of closets, um, you might want to look there as an, of other potential exposure sources. Now, I don't like, I don't know, how old's your kiddo? Um, he's almost three, he's like two and a half. 
Okay, so when I was little, we used to hide in the closet all the time. You know, the, the cats gave birth to the kittens in the closet. We had like secret cubbies all over our house. If, if you don't have like a kid that hides in the closet for games and hide and go seek, then, then the closets aren't probably an issue. Um, the bathroom, obviously, you're not necessarily eating in the bathroom. There's not a lot of hand to mouth activity necessarily, um, although, you know, could have, could have a leaded bathtub. And in the kitchen, um, a lot of times, especially in, in a house of that age, the kitchen's been remodeled already. Although I, I will often find one or more walls that are original that might have higher lead paint levels or um, baseboards or trim that wasn't remodeled. But most of the kitchen has generally been remodeled because, you know, that's a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, it's th so those potential hazards are less likely. Did you know, have your bathroom and kitchen been remodeled? Um, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm guessing it probably has at least a little bit. I mean, it looks like it's maybe from the eighties. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that the eighties is when, you know, gentrification really went into full swing in terms of bathroom and kitchen remodels. Like, like, I think I would almost, I don't know for sure, but probably the real estate philosophy that remodeling your bathroom and kitchen increased the real estate value probably came uh, into fruition um, in the 80s because of, of what was going on economically in the country. So I think that, that that's a likely assumption. Um, but but um, what, when did you get rid of those, those items in your home? Um, well, I took them down um, like two days ago and then I removed them from the house today. And did you, so, so the next step is to make sure to use like Clorox wipes to wipe down any surface underneath them. If it was a couch underneath them, um, you know, maybe get a, a, a wet shampoo of the couch. I don't know what they were next to. Do you, are they? So that, so, you know, I had one of them actually in the window behind me and I actually do have a new couch um, just happened to but I took the one that was behind me down because my son used to play behind it and touch it all the time. And I was worried about him like hurting himself with broken glass. It didn't, even though I knew it was made of lead, I didn't dawn on me that that could be the dangerous lead for him. You know, yeah. I just oh, yeah. didn't put two and two together. Don't blame yourself. <laughs> you know, don't blame yourself at all. Cause when, you know, it's like, why would this beautiful thing that everyone has in their home that somebody made as art be dangerous? You know, we don't have yeah. that um, perspective. Um, unfortunately, we're not, we're not raised with that. You know, we didn't, we didn't have this class before we gave birth to our children about, you know, home hazards and things like that. And we should, we need a class. <laughs> yeah. But so it, <clears throat> was, that, was that white curtain there prior uh, when the stained glass was there? That was there. Yeah. And I was thinking I need to either get rid of it or wash it or oh, do something with it. I would roll it up towards the window in on itself. So you're not shaking out any dust that might be on the, on the window side. And I would roll it up on itself um, and then and remo and remove it and wash it. And you can wash it like uh, two or three times in the washing machine. And that okay. should get any lead dust from there. And I would use the Clorox wipes to wipe off the surfaces of the windowsill. And because it was hanging in the windowsill and I'm assuming for quite some time it was hanging there. Yeah. Yeah. I would maybe even, you know, go so far as make sure you get the grooves of the side of the window and any, any, um, any horizontal surfaces like on the edge of the functional part of the window. I don't know what kind of window you have, but um, okay. you, know, you, you might as well go overboard because your kiddo tested positive, right? Yes, yes. Um, and, and, and you already removed the suspected source. So it's not like, like if you can clean super, super thoroughly now, um, hopefully the, the, then there won't be any uh, ongoing exposure. Um, if you think that, and so I would do that wherever there was one of those items, if where the Tiffany lamp was, Okay. Um, you know, wh wherever else there was an item, if there's any cloth items near where those items were like a, a, a washable rug, uh, wash that if you can. And if there's any hard surfaces, wipe those down. And then I would, um, if your kiddo can tolerate garlic, I'm sure your doctor said there's nothing to be done, right? First off. Yeah, she didn't say anything about diet. And I'm reading that that diet, you know, if you do the iron and the vitamin C and I just saw that post about garlic. I, I was just reading it right before I came on here. I, I don't know. I didn't know about that. 
Yeah, so the garlic has been really well studied uh, scientifically in different countries. I think there's a study from Vietnam, a study from Korea, a study from Japan. There might be some US studies, but there's been like studies all over the world. And what they learned was that the garlic supplementation is as effective, if not more effective than some of the chemical chelation agents that they're using oh, with wow. the other and kids in hospitals. So they're, they're actually recommending that garlic be added to the hospitalization protocol for children who come in with acute lead exposure. So it's not oh, wow. just woo, you know, and then okay. I, I joke, but it's true. You know, you go back to, well, your grandma said garlic's good for you. So, you know, it, it is. And some people can't tolerate it though. So you want to oh, be careful about that. But for us, you know, we add garlic to anything that we can, that the kiddos will eat just to kind of make it part of our life. So we put it on pizza, we roast it and put it, smear it on toast. We add it to soups. We put it uh, raw in with guacamole. Um, the kids, um, my kids will eat it. However, we use powdered garlic, garlic raw, roasted, all the different things. The studies show, um, different types of garlic being used. So uh, some of the studies are with cooked garlic, some have powdered garlic, some have raw garlic, and they all argue different levels of efficacy based on whatever they use. And I don't think there's a consensus about what kind is best. Uh -huh. So if your kid doesn't have any medical issues with garlic and if they'll tolerate it and like it, and if you can hide it in their food, um, then, then add some garlic. I mean, I think the uh -huh. best way for me like to introduce garlic is uh, like, everything bagels with with um maybe like cream cheese with a little bit of also roasted garlic okay yeah something that's already very flavorful where they won't yes to hide it um anyways th that that's one thing we did not do the iron supplementation and we did not do the vitamin c supplementation for our children and we did not do the calcium supplementation because when we started doing that deep dive into the supplements we saw that they were all they have iron in, i mean they have lead in them right yeah, and a lot of them are contaminated and one of the things with lead poison kiddos, even at a blood level five, and our kid, our younger, our older son at the time had a blood level four, and our, our baby had a blood level 16 when the kids were poisoned, um, the, the constipation is, is, a, is an issue. And so when you add, the problem is you got a kiddo who's got lead exposure. So what happens is their GI tract shuts down and they're not processing food properly. And so then you give them an iron supplement that makes them constipate on top of when they already have constipation. And then the doctors are prescribing Miralax to deal with the, the constipation that they exacerbated by, by prescribing iron. And then these kids are getting addicted to Miralax and then they have no bowel function when they're eight, nine, 10, 12 years old. And yeah. it's really, we just, when we look, went down that rabbit hole, we decided um, to not, to not do that, but uh, you, you know, should watch your kiddos iron levels. You should check in with your doctor, you know, all of those things. But for us, um, we developed, um, we always had this, but, but we were more strict about it. Uh, you know, the apple a day keeps the doctor away. Uh -huh. It's, it's goofy, but I make my kids eat an apple every day. <laughs> all my kids and they all know that so they all grew up always eating apples we live in in Oregon so it's easy you know there's lots yeah. of apples. but um you know and and the other thing that that was really important um in the space of not taking a supplement and being concerned for constipation uh, caused by lead exposure was that if they were going to have any bread products that, that we make them eat an apple and then they can have a piece of bread or half a bagel or whatever. And then they have some carrots or something afterwards. So that there's always um, vegetables, raw vegetables in their system. Because what we noticed, especially with my older, well, my kiddo, Avi, who was the baby when he was poisoned, is that his, his when he eats processed foods, meaning bread or anything like anything made, anything not raw, <laughs> um, that his body doesn't send the signals to his GI tract to digest it. So it just gets stuck there. And so, but the raw foods, his, his body says, okay, I have to, I have to work. I have to digest this. So we make sure that he has a vegetable and raw vegetables in there to um, help him digest anything else he's eating. So we really try and limit bread and pasta and other things like that, because um, one, it, it's, you know, not so good for the kids, <laughs> but yeah. with, with the, with the GI issue, it's, um, it's a huge problem. And you, you, one thing I, and I know, well, I, I I mean, I'm concerned for your kiddo because the blood level five is serious. Yeah. Um, my son, AJ, had a blood level four. And with that, um, he had an acute exposure. He was three when he was poisoned. 
and he has pretty severe dyslexia. Um, and so, um, you know, this is not to make you upset, but to say, you know, uh, you might face those challenges, but you won't know until he's six, seven or eight years old, you know, because you won't know until. Well, well he is already speech delayed and, and, and he does seem to have a little of hyperactivity already. And so I don't know how long this has been going on because this is the first time we've tested. Yeah. Um, well, if you've been in the same house the whole time or. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, that's been going on since you've been in the house, right? Yes. So, so, so I would speech delay. AJ had speech delay. He had speech regression actually, and, mm -hmm. and, and speech delay and articulation issues. He ended up going to speech therapy. Um, and then he had dyslexia. <laughs> he had dyslexia. He had GI issues. Um, AJ had what they called abdominal migraines. So, and this is, you know, he, he only had a blood level four. So mm -hmm. he had trouble eating. So his, his stomach hurt him. Like someone was stabbing him if he was hungry. So before he ate, if he ate food and then if he was digesting the food. So there was only like an hour or two a day. Small window. Yeah. That, that his stomach that, didn't hurt. And his stomach didn't hurt. And mm -hmm. they, they, the doctors treated it like it was a psychological disorder. And I'm like, uh -huh. no, this is not a psychological disorder. Um, yeah. they, they called it abdominal migraines, which they put in the category of psychology, but it's not. It was actually a physiological reaction to his GI system not working properly. The other mm -hmm. thing that happened with AJ that we learned was that he, um, that he couldn't eat dairy. And we tried, I mean, I, I have, my husband's vegan, but I'm not. And, um, AJ can't eat dairy. So I, I would try and give the kids milk because I'm like, okay, you need some protein and some fast calories. Here's some, you know, chocolate milk or whatever. Yeah. And that, that backfired. So you might, I don't know if what your kiddos, do you have any GI stuff going on? I'm, I was just assuming you might. Because of um, you know, I feel like we used to a lot. Um, the, like when he was really a smaller, it seemed like um, he had some, some stomach problems, but less now. Um, but we haven't been doing any supplements, but we've just been trying to get him to eat foods that we know are high in iron. But but then I'm confused because like even today I was reading that raisins uh, may have lead in it. So I, th I thought raisins might be good, but now I'm like, well, maybe raisins aren't so good. So well, any dried fruit is going to be concentration. Um, there's a potential for a concentration of lead in the dried fruit. So I, you, you should limit dried fruit. Did I give my kids raisins? Yeah, sure. You know, um, but you mm. can with other stuff, like I would, one of my things my kids would love was like raisins mixed with um, yogurt. And, um, and, and, you know, the idea was um, to get fruit in them and, and fiber in them and, and calories in them to, but again, s s making sure they had fresh fruit and vegetables on, on either side of something like That's that. Because, yeah. Um, the other thing, so the end, the end result of that story is that AJ just left two days ago for his semester abroad in Valencia, Spain. He's on a full tuition scholarship. He's getting straight, straight A's in college. You know, it's not okay. that he's not a brilliant kid. He's a brilliant kid. And we had massive struggles with his dyslexia, with his GI stuff, with his speech regression, with his speech therapy, all the things. Mm -hmm. and, and the hardest thing for us now that he's a man, he's 20 now is that, that he, um, he doesn't want people to think of him as disabled, but he's, he's actually mm -hmm. giving me, I said, are you okay if I talk about you and your disabilities now that you're an adult? And he said, yeah, mom, because they're, they are my disabilities and, and I am okay with it, but he doesn't like go, hello, I'm disabled, you know, you know, yeah. you, um, and, <laughs> and it's been a real challenge in college for him to fight for his rights as a disabled person, because, you know, when you don't look disabled, which is a big thing that happens with that, yeah. person, they don't look disabled, but they can have pretty significant disabilities, then your, your teachers aren't necessarily as compassionate or forgiving. And, and unless you really articulate, you learn to self-advocate for the resources you need as, as a student. And so that's what, um, that's what we've, that's been one of our biggest challenges with AJ and with, um, with my, also with my son, Avi. So, so that's what you have to look forward to, meaning you're going to have maybe some struggles along the way, but that doesn't mean your child can't excel because now, you know, your kiddo was lead poisoned and knowing that he was poisoned, you're armed with, okay, I have to treat this differently. He's not acting up and being aggressive because 
he's a bad kid. He's not hyperactive yeah. because of something I fed him. He's not, um, you know, he's not, he's not, not listening because, because he's shutting down because he doesn't like me or being bad. He, he sometimes has auditory processing and he can't process all the streams at once. So there's all these different reasons that are lead related that, that might, might cause um, behavioral issues that now that you're armed with the knowledge that he's been exposed, you can handle them in a more um, kind of open-minded way, I guess, you know, that, that you know, yeah. it's easy to get mad at our kids when they do stupid stuff. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you only have, a, do you have any other children or just the baby? Yes. I have a six month old. Oh, oh, okay. So, so, and, and, and I asked the doctor, well, shouldn't I test her too? And she's like, yeah, you could do that. And so I did, but they didn't give me a number. And I saw that you said to look on the site and to see how to do the lead levels because they just told me it was less than two. But that doesn't, said, I don't know what that means. Well, well I don't, I want to know her number, you know? So I almost want to get hers redone too, just so I know like, what, what was it? Was it 1.8? But that's a lot for a six month old, right? I mean, right. and you can't know, um, you'd have to go to a different lab probably. You'd have to call your ch local children's hospital and I have a whole article about this on the website, but um, you can go to your, you know, call the Children's Hospital uh, phlebotomy lab and find out do they, what their low threshold of detection is. Do you live in an urban area? Where do you live? Yes, I live in Texas. Okay, so if you, you probably have some good children's hospitals there. It's a big place though. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so go to your local children's hospital and, but call first and, and see if they, they have the capability of testing down to, you know, a, a blood level one or a blood level less than one or, you know, 1.5. Because with children's hospitals, they're often working on um, neonatal, you know, NICU kiddos, tiny babies. And so they sometimes have much more precise testing. They don't always, but they they often do. So uh -huh. it's to call first. Okay. Go to your local clinic. And then did you watch the film yet? Yes, I did. Okay. Good. 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 Yeah. So yeah. you might want to watch it again. I mean, there's a lot of language. I think I will. Cause I, I, I watched it and then, you know, it was late at night. So now I'm like, wait, what, what were, the, what were you saying? So I'll definitely have to watch that again. Yeah. It's information dense, but for parents who have a kiddo who tested positive for lead, it gives you a lot of the language and context to help fight with your doctors, fight with your school people, you know, the educators and others so that you can advocate for, um, yeah. any resources your kiddo might need. Yeah. Um, and you know, I wanted to mention too, that, you know, my mom made these stained glass windows and she actually died of a brain tumor of, a uh, glioblastoma multiforme brain tumor. And I was seeing online that, um, they think that, um, those tumors are caused by, uh, lead, um, I, or I that they could be related to lead um poisoning so i thought that that was kind of an interesting uh thing that she she died from that you know how old was she 48 jeez that's really young yeah <laughs> um yeah and so then there's all this extra sentimentality attached to her artwork right yeah and and then and then and, and also since she died i mean it makes me even more scared about my children, like, you know, the, the seriousness of it, you know? Did she, did she do those stained glass windows in the house where you are now or somewhere else? Um, in, a, in, a, in our old house, in a, in a townhouse, but I, she did it on the kitchen table and I helped her, you know? Yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't know, you know? You should get tested too. Just for yeah. Her, right. Um, the, um, the thing about the brain tumor, I, I can't speak to that specifically as I'm not a doctor, but um, what we know about lead is that lead interrupts all biological uh, systems and lead biomimics calcium, especially in, in the brain um, and um, and soft tissue where there's a, you know, it's absorbing um, lead, uh, lead in the place of, of calcium if mm -hmm. there's lead present. So it's not unlikely um, that, that there's a link. And a lot of the research, unfortunately, doesn't establish causal links. It, 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 it stops short of establishing causal links to certain diseases. It says, you know, they're correlative links. And that's yeah. 
but I think that's in part because of um, industry influence on some of the research where they intentionally are only looking for a correlative link and they're not allowed to make that leap or do the follow-up research or find the resources to, to, to make the jump to um, determining whether or not there's a causal link over a correlative link. But mm -hmm. the, the one thing for that is, uh, is asthma. So, you know, there's this, all these uh, correlative links between low-income families uh, with asthma and low-income families with lead exposure. Well, they're the same families. Gee, what do you think about that? Yeah. Well, they're saying that there's not a causal link. And one of the um, allegations is that, uh, that a causal link hasn't been established due to lead industry pressure on, um, on, on the scientific um research bodies to not determine a causal link because if you could do, if asthma is one of the most well studied um diseases in terms of the financial impacts out there so like th th there's all sorts of really solid data on the financial impacts of children with asthma um health impairments caused by asthma you know loss of work caused by asthma loss of school days caused by asthma it's all financially um you know numerically quantifiable and if the lead industry were found to be causally um implicated in causing this very well-defined financial implication in terms of the health impact on our children and our country and our it's very and costly our i guess and they wouldn't want to yeah, they, 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 that. yeah. They, exactly it's it, and 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 the nice thing for the lead industry unfortunately is that people think of all these diseases as independent um mm -hmm. and, and in fact um in, in the film dr lanfear talks about how you know we're all poisoned to some degree and there is no way to do a study independent of lead exposure because we all have some yeah. levels of lead exposure. So um, all of the research done since the industrial revolution on, on human health uh, clusters of disease is all in the presence of lead exposure and you can't isolate them. Um, mm -hmm. but, but there's a reluctance in the medical community to, to acknowledge that. So I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> that's very helpful. I have one more quick question. Um, you know, my grandmother also gave me, um, when she passed away, I got her, I think you say Corel wear the, anyways, I got rid of that too. But um, I was wondering, you know, my son never ate off of those plates, but we had them and we put them in the dishwasher. Would, would the lead have leached off, do you think, in the dishwasher and gotten on his plates or? I think kind of hard to that's say? likely, I think that's less. So the thing is, the dish detergent you're using has surfactants that washes away any lead particulates. I see, and then it gets down the drain with the with the yeah. soap. Kind of thing. So it's okay. less likely that there's a kind of a cross contamination with that particular um, those particular dishes. It's not impossible, but it's less likely. Um, I really think you know that your stained glass situation is is a, is a very likely cause. Of a blood level five, I don't think that's an unreasonable concern at all. So, what I would do if I were you is I would, well, I mean, what does your kid like to eat? <laughs> He's kind of a picky eater, um, so um, that's challenging too. You know, it's hard to get him to eat the fresh vegetables, and uh, he does like fruit. Um, okay. But um, what about um, steamed carrots, like lightly steamed carrots, or? Yeah. we've tried that before we could try it again but um the, i he didn't really take to them uh sorry my my littlest is having a meltdown here okay um, uh, and what about like um i used to give my kids frozen blueberries all the time because they were like that's a good idea uh, trader joe's has the organic frozen blueberries that are the wild blueberries they're really tiny so they're not like uh -huh. a hazard where some of the other frozen blueberries are really big <laughs> and can be a choking hazard. Um, and so um, I would definitely consider, um, you know, things like that, um, if, if that's something that he'll eat. Um, I, I, you know, little things that little kids, I think, for peas, you know, uh, you know, just uh -huh. frozen peas that they cook lightly or, you know, fresh peas, um, obviously fresh is better. Um, you know, just as much as if, if you find like three or four vegetables that he likes, it, it, go heavy on them, you know, just, okay. just to get through the next month, um, and fruit, fresh fruit, uh, versus dried whenever possible, you know, maybe limit the raisins, no molasses, um, no, no chocolate, you know, avoid some of the high lead things. Um, 
celery, well-washed celery, well-washed carrots, celery with peanut butter was my kids loved. We put some raisins on the top, right? Ants on a log. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, that those are options. And then, um, and then I would, I would give them juice as much as possible. Like, um, I did like any kind of juice. Uh, natural juices, if you can make them, not the, not the, okay. like, you know, store-bought juices, if you have a juicing uh, machine, but, but, um, but also you can water those down. So there's not a lot of calories extra. It's not about like, so much ah! sugar, but it's about more flushing the system out. Um, and then, um, and, and I used to give my kids uh, water with lemons so that they would drink more water because if you have lemon in it, they drink more water. And then at the end of a month, I would get your kid a retested um, because I think that it's highly likely that after a month, his blood level will go down and it should go down by half. It should be like 2.6. Okay. If that was the source. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I've been trying to test the paint and stuff and I, the swabs aren't coming positive on the paint. And I, you know, I tried, I, I'm surprised that I feel bad because I have all these questions that the health department hasn't contacted me yet. I thought that they would contact me pretty quickly but it's already been since december 30th since he's had the test and, and i haven't heard anything and i tried contacting them but i can't get a hold of them yeah you literally are in the wild west right <laughs> i mean you're you're in texas and there's not a lot of resources there and there's not a lot of the the lead poisoning prevention resources are geographically limited mostly to uh -huh. urban areas and they, I don't know um, what urban areas in Texas received any of the grant funds. For example, in Oregon, only Portland has, gets the grant funds, no other city. Um, so the rest of the state is effed, you know, you, there's, not, there's no resources. And, um, and sometimes the lead program here can go outside of Portland if there's an acutely poisoned kid, they can get like an exception to go to Eugene or something, but the, the funding isn't there. So, okay. so it, it's not unusual that you aren't, aren't being contacted. I'm not surprised. Um, but I would definitely, um, anyway, uh, heavy on the liquids, you know, water, juices, not again, not, not store-bought, not concentrated, not dried fruit, fresh, fruit. Actual, fresh, ju freshly juiced ones. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I know that's not easy for everyone. Um, and then I would um, retest in 30 days and, and, and if you have removed the source, his blood level should be down by 50% at the end of those 30 days, which is good and bad because one, you'll know that you've removed the source, but then two, you'll kind of have determined that, oh shit, excuse my French, but that means your kiddo was likely exposed his entire first two and a half years from those windows, right? I know, that's what I'm really worried about. And I, I guess it's not um, a, a standard to test kids um, in Texas, yeah, unless they're in Medicaid or something, because we don't have that. And so it's not, we weren't, it wasn't, it wasn't suggested to yeah. test. And that's the same with us, you know, they didn't, and that's why I want you to get your baby tested if you can. And I think that's a good follow-up. I mean, you're, it's great that your baby's less than two. That's excellent. Um, but also your baby wasn't interacting with the uh, windows. So that kind of yeah. supports that it may have been the windows. The window. Um, and the, I mean, you know, the, the stained glass. So, so um, you know, that that's, there's a lot, of, you know, it's a puzzle. It's, and it's, yeah. the puzzle's pretty, uh, the puzzle's coming together pretty clearly. Uh, but the other thing is, if you get the early interventions, you get the speech therapy, you can, you can qualify uh, for early intervention through the school district. So what that looks like for a two and a half year old is, um, is guided educational play. So, you know, they might assign the therapist to come to your house to play with your kid on educational games. And then they'll teach you some, some educational games that maybe are a little more specific than you might be doing already at home. Um, you know, um, I'm, I'm, are, do you have a partner? Are you married or? Yeah. Yes. So in a home where there's two adults, and you know it's a it's a the family's together and um, and there's resources in general. Those kiddos are going to do better than a, a you know a single mom family or a, you know where there's where parents are spread thin. And so you have time to spend with your kid because you can actually in a lot of ways combat some of the impacts of lead exposure through um, you know engagement in in learning you know just like really focused engagement in learning and for us one of the really important things we did that really made a difference 
in, in a profound way for us was we really immersed our children in music. And um, the thing is, you know, okay. Yeah, I, I, I mean, play, play music in the background, get musical toys, uh, music boxes, whatever you, you've got going on, because the neural pathways that may have been impacted by the lead exposure um, can be strengthened through music. There's there's evidence showing that. And and also, um, for example, our son Avi, he has a brain injury with his visual memory in the fourth percentile, and he can't read anywhere near grade level, um, but he can learn audit with auditory skills. And he's really musical because the, his it, we, we work with him to help to give him every tool he needed to help strengthen where he are. The verbal, is. like if you're lacking in the visual, but he's elevated yeah. in the verbal. That's really interesting. I feel really proud too, because my son just learned Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. So that's right up his alley. That sounds like a really positive thing to... Um, yes, he's learning Frozen songs too. <laughs> um, Oh, oh another, so, thing, another thing we did, um, and I'm saying I don't see anybody else with their hands up, so I'm like spending all this time talking to you. But you're you're an important you're an important <laughs> conversation. I think everybody else yeah. is probably learning from this conversation as well. So um, if anybody else has a question, put your hand up so I can see it. I don't, um, you know, your little raise your hand thing, but nobody else is. So um, let's keep going with this. But um, okay. one of the things that we did for our kids was whenever we watch TV or movies, or whatever, we always had the subtitles on. So yes, yeah. They, they, we actually just happen to have that on. This that's a good thing too to um to get him to start associating the the letters with 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 it. Yeah, and that's for everything. And 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 um, it's interesting because Avi's now at seven. Avi is seventeen now. He was poisoned when he was seven months old, and he's rewatching movies and re-listening to songs that he listened to when he was little. And he's finally able to understand things that like what they mean, even though he heard the words and he 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 saw the plots or he saw the stories unfold either in the movies or the songs or whatever. And he's finally connecting the dots, but he knows he's he knows the language from having heard it so many times. But it's mm -hmm. taking him time to sometimes uh connect what connect everything. Words, yeah, what the words mean. But he's he's again also super smart, you know, um and and uh, we probably are a little too lenient with the YouTube usage. We let our kids learn uh, with us all the amazing science channels online because they, since Avi can't read, he can he can learn science from some of these incredible YouTube channels um, where they've got you know these young people with PhDs in various areas of science that that uh, have educational programs for kids. So that's something to look for. We've got a couple posts up on the website of uh, these favorite YouTube channels. I have to update that. So, um, you know, that's down the line <laughs> when he's older. Yeah. And hoping, you know, there's possibility you might see no impacts whatsoever. You know, there's still that possibility, but you're telling me you have possibly had some GI stuff, you have speech delay, you know, you've already hyperactivity, you're, you're seeing the cluster already. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 is there another, is there somebody asking a question? Does anybody else have a question? Oh, I got two questions. Yeah, I got two. So okay. You have, uh, final you thoughts? Spending your time. No, but thank you for all your, your help. That was really helpful. Okay. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. Okay. I'm going to see. I'm going to go to Catherine and then I have to figure out, I don't know how to do all of this. Hold on. Um, let's see. I don't know how to, <laughs> here we go right here. Let's see, uh, remove pin, there we go. Hi, <laughs> can you can, hey. can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I really enjoyed listening to you talk to her. So thank you so much for taking our questions. Yeah, no um, I'm a little nervous to talk to you, but I just wanted to run a situation by you and maybe get your input on it. Yeah. Um, I have an eight-year-old son and he has had a lot of developmental issues his whole life. And whenever I was pregnant with him, like he always measured small. He, I ended up with preeclampsia. He was born a few weeks early. He had a hole in his heart that's thankfully resolved since then. He had an enlarged kidney. He had um, one of the angel kiss birthmarks. He had a tooth that wasn't formed. Now he has peanut allergies and eczema. And we went through all of the therapies for like feeding issues and gross and fine motor delays and you know social skills are impacted and he has some ADHD symptoms um 
difficulty controlling his emotions and cognitively delayed by about a year or two, but he's doing great. I mean, you know, he's, he's such a sweet boy. I, I listen to all these things and I'm like, but that's not who he is to me. Right. Um, I'm totally there right. with you. you know? Right. I'm just, I'm just kind of reading you my laundry list, right. Yeah. <laughs> of all the reasons we've had concerns and I don't live in an older home. Our home was built in the nineties, but whenever I was pregnant with him, my parents had just finished renovating and moving into um, an old farmhouse that was built in probably like the 1880s, 1890s, somewhere around there. And they did the whole thing where they put in central heating and air. So that was a lot of, you know, cutting out and, and you know, they renovated the whole thing. And when I was visiting with them, I was going through the whole nesting thing where I wanted to help them clean. And I remember dusting all of the window seals and helping clean off everything. And, you know, I'm looking at it now, you know, this is all kind of new to me that, that it can impact a child so much, but just when I was pregnant, I mean, I maybe did that once or twice because they don't live close. We, you know, we only went down a couple of times, but I don't know. I'm wondering if that could have been enough to cause all of these issues because we've never gotten an answer. Yes. The answer is oh. yes. Um, and, and then not, and don't, don't be, don't feel blamed. You know, that's always, we are, it's always that, you know, don't, take a yeah. breath. You're not blamed, yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> but yes. Um, your situation reminds me of a situation of a friend of my son's who, who, the, um, she's, so she's the same age as he is. So she's, she's 26 now. Um, and, and her mama did the same thing you did. Um, and, but her husband had just bought a, a store, an old, an old building to turn into a store and she was pregnant and she visited him at the store while he was doing all these renovations. And she would like lie down on the floor, uh, pregnant while he was sanding, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it really, really would just take a couple of times to cause if you've got sanding and construction dust a couple of times is enough. But have you, did you watch my film yet? I did. So, so my kids were essentially poisoned in one day. And I, and, and I don't know how clear that is from the film, but it was the day that they burned the paint off the house. And that caused this acute poisoning of my children. Yeah, there was persistent additional exposure after that. And I was likely poisoned at the same time, but I wasn't tested at all until I was pregnant with my, uh, my fourth child. So um, it, 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 this kind of significant level of impact can be created through a single incident or a couple of incidents of significant dust exposure from a home under renovation. That's why this is so important, you know? And um, do your parents still live there? They do. Um, and I've asked, you know, just a couple of times like, oh, you know, did y'all ever have anything tested? They, you know, none of that happened. You know, what I saw in the film where you'd like dissolved all of the paint and everything. They had concrete siding put in. Um, I mean, everything, they, they had to, the floors were just plywood when they moved in. It, it hadn't been lived in in many years. Um, I think really the main thing that they did was where it was causing a lot of dust might've been the um, putting in the central heating and air. But yes, they still live there. Um, so I'm always, I mean, we do go visit them, but I'm always kind of on edge about what the kids are touching. And I don't know if dust that's on their, you know, on the windowsills, like would that still, could that still contain lead? I don't know. Yeah, it um, can. So, so um, how you have, how many kids? I have three now. And how old are the other ones? Um, I have, so he's eight and then I have a six-year-old and I have a, he'll be two in, in March. Um, have you got the other tested? They've, you know, the, the pediatrician has done the routine lead testing. I, I can't remember at what ages they do it at, but I know that they have all been tested at some point and it's never come back significant. And really it never even crossed my mind. Cause you know, every time we go into for an appointment, they ask the questions, do you live in a home that was built before, you know, they say like 70 something, and, 78, yeah. but yeah, but we, we've never, no one's ever tested positive. I've never been tested, but the kids have never tested positive and did we do get, go visit them. Did you get numbers? Like did, when you, when they said, did you get an actual blood lead level number when you got them tested? Like a less than, was um, it less than three, less than one? I don't know if it was an, I just know that it said not detected. Okay. I that's think good. I, 
yeah it's not definitive i'll um i'll um well look up um the, put the words is my child poisoned in the search bar on the website and you'll find this post that talks about the less than readings and and the limitations of those readings i've read uh, a little bit about that yeah yeah so so what i would do if i were in your and what i did in your circumstance because my mom bought this house and she was doing all this construction i'm like ah my kids aren't coming to your house and um I made her get testing. So, um, and she didn't want to at first, but then she was amenable after a while. So it took a bit of a convincing. I don't know if your parents would be convinced with your son's disabilities, perhaps they will. I don't, um, yeah, I, I worry about the guilt factor too. Like, uh, I mean, I have, it's been weighing on me so much ever since I read your story about your son and then looked a little bit more into it about how it can impact you when you're pregnant. And since, I guess it's since I don't, like I've told myself, I don't know for sure. And I haven't wanted to put that possible. I don't know if this even makes well, sense. I didn't so, so talk to them and like maybe cause a whole thing if yeah, I didn't know for sure. This, this other family I was mentioning, my son's friend, the, 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 the girl has a, a, a whole, whole set of disabilities very, and, and, and issues very similar to your son, what you just described. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so it's not, it's, it's highly likely that, that this is, unless you have like other major genetic uh, predispositions, but the problem is that the, the, it's not a problem, it's, it's actually an indicator. If you have these as, um, genetic predispositions in your family, often the lead is the tipping point. So like people ask, well, are certain people more susceptible to lead exposure than other people? Well, in fact, yes, in a way, if you have genetic predispositions towards X, Y, and Z, and then you have, uh, you know, as health impairments, then you have a lead exposure that um, shuts down your immune system and, and compromises other um, biological functions, then you're more likely to have those issues. So, so the, the, it's, it's a combined, you know, confounding factors. Um, the, um, the, the thing is, well, how old are your parents? They're in their 70s. Okay, so they were like hippies, or sort of maybe, because hippies were in their are in their seventies now, right? Um, anyway, so what I always tell people as an opening opening bid is um, is is as share my film with them, say, hey, my friend Tamara made this movie because her kids were acutely lead poisoned. It's a horrible story. I'd love to share it with you. She said I could share it with you. She's the director and <laughs> it has music donated by The Who and music donated by Tom Waits. And um, John Fish, the drummer of the band Fish is the executive producer and has an interview with Noam Chomsky. And, and I don't know what their politics are, if that's if that's a good thing. Don't mention Noam if they're not, if it's not a Noam fan. Um, and, and Bernie Sanders is, has a brief cameo in it. You know, you, almost everybody doesn't notice burning in it but but anyway the, the main thing is i tell people about the who and tom waits because your parents at 70 they're fans of the who unless they are like not rock and roll fans at all you know I mean, are <laughs> they or sure are they? they i'm sure they were <laughs> so if they I've, if they, I've seen they're all records so yeah <laughs> okay so if you know that they were fans of the who say tamra showed the film um to uh um, Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey and Roger uh, got back to her and said oh my god you know my family was lead poisoned when I was young and I want to give you lifetime rights to behind blue eyes and when when people like of that age see hear that story they're like oh this is kind of cool that you know Roger Daltrey donated the lifetime rights to behind blue eyes to this film and then when Tom Waits saw the film and you know people either love or hate Tom Waits but he's kind of cool um if it, when Tom Waits saw the film I asked him if he would um donate uh some original composition some original score and he said no he didn't have time but i could use anything in his library for free so there's five tom Waits songs in the film because he was so moved by the project so these these are inconsequential in terms of the message except for the fact that they help get through to one men sometimes and two older people um because yeah. you're like wow if this is such an important project these really influential musicians donated their time and their energy and their and their and their art to this project maybe it's worth watching. And so, mm -hmm. so if they watch the film and if they see any of uh, your son in my son, Avi, in terms of you know, behaviors or anything or uh, anything that they hear about, um, you know, the medical complications that are discussed in the film, then, then you say, hey, you know, mom and dad, I think we should get some dust wipe samples done at your house. You know, couldn't yeah. hurt. I've got three kids and I want to make sure your house is safe. 
not I've got three kids and I think your house is a dangerous pit and you caused my son's disabilities. But I, I think, you know, we need to make sure, especially for my baby, that your house is safe moving forward. And if it isn't safe, then, you know, you can, you're, you're part of the, are you part of the group on Facebook or? I am. So mm -hmm. you can, you know, post, you know, post, get the dust wipe samples. Uh, they're, 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 they're linked um, in the group a bunch. Um, and uh, just get a few, get a five pack for starters. And if any of them come back over five micrograms per square foot, um, so even if they come back at six or eight or 10, um, then you need to do further testing and you might want to have a full professional hazard assessment. But the dust wipe samples, the five pack, it's like $65. So that's not like not like a huge expense. Um, and and do, do the dust wipe sampling in dusty areas, like the inside of an air return for your heating duct or underneath a, um, a radiator, if there are radiators, or underneath a bookshelf or under a couch, something like that, um, where okay. you are more likely to be able to collect old dust that's been sitting around a while, you know, but that's harder to reach. Because <laughs> then okay. you'll have a better sense of what it might, what the elevated levels might be or might have okay. at, at their highest. So do you think if, I mean, if we did the dust wipe sample and it came back positive and we were able to, you know, figure out the source of any continued lead exposure, I, I, I worry the most about the air conditioning system, I guess, because it's just such an old house. I mean, do you think that if you remove the source, then eventually the air I'm, or would you have to have like the whole system clean too i, I just I don't so know. my baby who's now 14 was likely poisoned because of the ductwork being contaminated mm -hmm. and again okay. one of the things stories that's not written up on the website i don't think um but um basically we did we had done a clearance testing of the house and then and then he was two when he tested positive and i'm like this is our lead-free house how can our baby be testing positive oh my god and um yeah. and so then um we realized that the interior of the ducts were all positive because someone had done work on the house like your parents someone had done a bunch of work on the house and not done any containment and and the duct work was all contaminated all the way through Luckily, we qualified for the grant at the time, so we got the grant through the city of Portland that I was mentioning earlier. Um, we were, since we had multiple lead poison kids, they approved the maximum allowable interventions, which is up to $24,999. I think they ended up doing like $18,000 or $19,000 worth of stuff on our house. It's all a bunch of mm -hmm. BS though, because if you didn't, if you if you priced it with normal contractors, it was probably about ten thousand dollars worth of work. But everything's doubled in price because it's through the city and every all the paperwork and contractors overcharge. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a lot of work. But you can get a hazard assessment um, and find out if that like do one of those dust wipe samples inside the if you can reach into any of the return vents for the air conditioning system. I don't know what the system looks like, but um, I can yeah they um, have a they have a panel you can take off. Yeah. So where they, and it's where they change the filter too. Yeah. Do the, so the, you change the filter and there's usually like a door where you change the filter, do a mm -hmm. dust wipe sample on the door. That is what comes up against the filter. Okay. That would be a really good indicator of uh, dust in the house that might be leaded. Okay. And anything over a five is concerning. Now um, I mentioned this in the conversation earlier this week, but when my kids were poisoned, the, interior register of our house was over 4,000. Oh, I'm so sorry. Goodness. And, and that, that was quite alarming, you know? Um, and at the time the hazard level was 40. So it was 4,000 to 40, but Dr. Lanford in the film talks about how a blood, I mean, sorry, a, a floor dust level of five is the, is the health protective level that you want it to be below five. The current federal standard for federal interventions is um, a floor dust sample uh, level of uh, of ten. They lowered it. Um, and so so officially, the feds say it's a problem if it's over ten. Now, if your parents live somewhere that has the grant, it, it'd have to be a municipality. What what state are they in? Um, Georgia. Very rural. They might be able to get it because they're rural. But the way you get the grant is by um, stating that your children visit more than six hours a week. If your children visit more than six hours a week, um, then your parents could qualify for the grant. If, if um, even if they aren't necessarily low income, um, but it depends on how taxed 
the system is um, for that particular area. I don't know about any of the grants in Georgia. I do know, of course, that the EPA is headquartered in Georgia. And so I think there's some allocations of funding there because they're more present and aware of the, the hazards in Georgia. Um, okay. And I think in rural areas, they might have a little more leeway since you know the federal offices are there as well. So, so it's worth looking into. Um, um, and, it, and you know, if if it does test positive, what you want to do is a really thorough lead abatement style cleaning. Um, and you know, we can talk about that. Uh, you know, if it tests positive, let me know. Don't worry about it now. I wouldn't bring the kids there until you've really, especially you know, anybody who plays on the floor, until you've got, gotten some dust wipe samples if you can. So yeah. first bet is try and convince your parents to watch the movie. Okay. 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 Yeah. All right. yeah so when I, I saw your movie and I saw that porch, I said, oh no, because <laughs> we love their front porch. And so, yeah, it really hit home. Yeah. Well, and that's the other thing is those porches, like I could have made a whole movie about families who were poisoned by their porches, because that is so often the story. Uh, because people do full renovations of their home and remediate. They'll like, they'll like put a hundred thousand dollars into a kitchen renovation and not touch the porch because it's not considered interior space and they don't put the money into it. And sometimes it's a little tricky because you might get into dry rot and you might, you know, there's stability issues and structural issues. And so people leave the porch for last almost always. And so very frequently, uh, porches are the source of a child's poisoning, like more frequently than you might imagine. Um, I mean, since there's, since we're at, at over time, which is, I'm fine with being over time. So I'll keep going. We've got three people with their hands raised. Okay. So I'm going to get to them and then just follow up with questions um, and, uh, you know, private message me if you need to. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm thankful for you. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see. I'm trying to figure out how to do the hand raised people. Let's see. Um, um, help me. How do I find who raised their hands? Um, three participants with raised hands. There we go. Uh, Catherine. Let's see. I don't know. I'm trying to figure out how to put it down. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'm not sure how to do this. Mute. Lower hand. Oh, somebody's coming into the room. That's, I think, number 14. Um, Kim. I, I don't know. Okay. I'm just trying to give me a, bear with me while I'm being an old person who can't figure out how to use my Zoom. Uh, window, view, does anyone know how to um, make it so I can see who raised their hands? <laughs> help me, Sarah, help me, do you know? Um, let's see, maybe I go here. Um, let's see. Um, Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out how to show all the pictures at the top. Um, there we go. Wait, that's Catherine. We just talked to her. Kim, is it Kim or KM? Um, let me just see. I think I got the little, I'm gonna go with um, Maria. There, Maria, you're, you're on. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, I can. Okay, I'm gonna try to see if I can get the video on too. Hold on. Ah, there okay. you are. Okay. Hi. <laughs> um, thank you for taking my call. <laughs> sure. um, so I had a few quick questions. I was looking on your website and you talk about uh, Corel, uh, yeah. the dinnerware, and yeah. how um, there is the printing on there has been tested positive. Yeah. If I have just the Corel that's completely white, almost like porcelain, yeah. is that also at risk? No, the plant. So there's two kinds of corral. There's a there's a ceramic kind, and then there's the um and then there's the glass. So the the, the very thin stuff is actually glass, and the plain white ones are all completely lead free. So um, that's not a concern. The ceramic might have a low level of lead. It's usually below ninety parts per million, so it's not like an exposure risk or anything. So the the plain white is, is good. Okay, and then I've been. Prior to following you, I've been doing a lot of, I've been trying to stay away from plastics. So I'm like, well, maybe metal's good. <laughs> now I'm learning otherwise. And I've literally been giving my kids these as their uh, tools to eat with. And it's called Avanchi. Oh yeah, and... I haven't tested those, um, but I, those are fine. Like for, for eating off of, I don't have a problem with stainless steel plates. I don't have a problem with stainless steel cups. I mean, spoons. I have a problem with stainless steel water bottles being used not for water that's the only issue and that's just because 
of uh, the potential for people to um, use them for long-term storage of beverages that aren't water. And then there can be uh, bleaching of, of nickel and chromium. I mean, okay. it's, not, it's not great. Stainless steel is not the best material, you know, um, but it, it, you're like, it's lesser of many evils, right? So you, you have to um, weigh that. It, it's the kind of thing where for adults who are dealing with um, chemical sensitivities and such, I ask them to consider getting a urine test if that's um, something their doctor would do or a hair test that's not legal in all states, it's legal in some states. And if your hair or your urine test is positive for metals like nickel and chromium, then you might not want to use stainless steel. And if it's not positive for metals like nickel and chromium, then you probably don't have an issue. If you're using stainless steel plates and cups and spoons just as like your dinnerware, it's not the same as if you're using stainless steel as a water bottle. Mm -hmm. And the main concern is that, I'm getting some feedback here. I don't know if, if what that's from, sorry. Um, the main concern is that um, stainless steel as a cookware for long form cooking is not ideal. So the studies show that when you're cooking something for longer than two hours, that stainless steel can leach over time. Now, the interesting thing is, the frustrating thing for me is that people want to like switch out their pots and pans and get new pots and pans. But in fact, if you've been cooking out of the stainless steel for 10 years, it's probably safer than anything you can get that's new because mm -hmm. it stops leaching or leaches less over time. And mm -hmm. so it's actually safer over time, especially if it's a higher quality um, pot or pan than something that you might get that's new. Does that make sense? What if the, like these plates have um, like cut marks from knives? Yeah. Is that, does that make it worse or is it not that big of a deal? Not that big of a deal. It's all the same. I mean, you know, uh, I, I use my kids, I have stainless steel plates. I use them for serving my kids peanut butter and jelly or, you know, celery sticks and carrot sticks. And I might, for something, we don't do things like spaghetti with sauce, but if we did, I would probably put it on a glass plate. You know? Okay. So like not heat, heated foods. Cause I, I put heated foods on there too. It's not gonna, it's not gonna, I mean, this is just theoretical in terms of the potential impact because nobody's studying it. I, I really don't have a huge concern, you know, um, for putting heated foods. Got just, it. Just when you're talking about acidic foods, you just want to maybe notice your habits. And if you have alternatives, you know, that that might be a better choice. That's, that's great. And if not, you know, like if you're camping, it's no problem. Just put it on the damn stainless steel plates. You'll be fine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it doesn't have to be um, uh, an area of concern. Just, I, my main area of concern is people putting juice in water bottles or coffee in water bottles and, um, you know, leaving it in overnight and that sort of thing. My, um, I've been, I was making smoothies for my kids and putting them in the uh, stainless steel Contigo containers overnight. Yeah. And I would leave them in there for like a day or two. So I don't have to make smoothies every day. Now I'm thinking not the best move. No. Yeah. Do you put the smoothie in your ball jar, put the ball jar in the back of the fridge where it's nice and cold or, you know, in the freezer or whatever. Um, and then, um, you know, I mean, if I wanted to keep my smoothies cold, I'd put, I'd make ice cubes out of it and put it in an ice cube tray and then I'd be able to dole it out and pour them. I think that's probably an easy way to do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would not do that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm going to get another, one other question. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for being here. Um, let's see. I'm going to go with Kelsey and I'm going to unpin Maria. I, I soon I'll figure this all out. Hi, Kelsey. <laughs> Hello. Um, I had posted probably a couple months ago, I have all these heirloom plates, Blue Ridge Southern Pottery plates that are all hand painted. And I had a friend come over and test them. And of course they tested insanely high in lead. Um, uh, with an XRF instrument or what kind of test? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but her gun, she works for um, a company, but her gun measures it differently than your gun milligrams per centimeter squared probably yeah so yeah. my question is we stop using these plates in our house um i know that they're not good and honestly it was easy to stop using them now that i know the dangers of it my question is is we still have lots of family members that use those plates we have grandma great aunt we have my father-in-law my mother-in-law these are all plates that they use as their main 
like dishes that they eat off of. And I have shared all the information with them. You know, I even shared with them the results that we got from testing that my friend did for us, which we're so thankful she was able to do because that sort of thing's expensive. And so I guess my question is, is, you know, we went over to dinner tonight at my mother-in-law's house and those are the only place to eat off of. And I don't want to, everyone thinks I'm crazy. (laughs) thinks I'm absolutely insane. And my question is, is should I be the crazy person and bring my own plates to dinner? How old are your kids? Um, a 11 month old and a five year old. Planning on having more? No, not at the moment. So, so, um, so this, that happened to me. I went to Iowa. Where, what state are you in? Um, we're in Kansas city, Missouri. Okay. Um, I visited my friends in Iowa and this woman, I don't, she opened the door and she said, if you talk about lead in my house, I will kick you out. And I'm like, okay, I'm sorry you married my friend, (laughs) you know, but anyway, so we went into her house and she has adopted all these kids, like six kids from Africa or whatever. I mean, like a lot of kids, um, from all different countries. And then she has her table set. I don't know. There's just like this, like Iowa homesteader vibe, right? And first off, their their um, their their garden um, they have surrounded um, with a fence made out of lead painted windows and doors, and and then they had set their table with um, all mismatched china, every kind of mismatched china. Like that was the thing was all these different like English china is all really high lead, and every table setting was a different high lead china. And we sat down to this dinner with like. I think there must've been 20 people at the table or maybe it was only 15, but it was like them and all their kids and me and maybe some friends and my kids. And my son looked at me horrified, um, you know, because he knows he was lead poisoned and knows that this wasn't good. And um, I basically coached him to just take a bite off the top of the plate, like not that was not touching the plate and then Mm -hmm. push it away (laughs) and then like not eat it. I mean, seriously, if you know that it's high lead, it's not worth the risk. Like yeah, it's and, not worth the risk. And um, you know, I see her like putting them, I see other people putting them in the microwave, putting them in the dishwasher. And I'm just like, uh. <laughs> I mean, you, you can't, you can't, the, the, the moral of the story is you can't convince everyone. Um, obviously family is important, but um, you know, again, you could go, I don't know, did, did you just join or did you hear me talking about my movie earlier and the, and the, rock, and the rock and roll and stuff? I, I, have, I have watched your movie. Um, I have gotten my kids lead tested and I did select a children's hospital, but the only result I got was below two. So the doctor told me not to worry about it. And I tried calling the actual hospital that I got the, the lead test done at. And I haven't been able to get anyone on the phone to see if I can get like an actual report. Yeah. No well, if, it said, if it said less than two, they're not going to have a number. They wouldn't have done. Th- they're not like hiding a number from you. If the number okay. they gave you is less than two, that's the only number they have. It was a low threshold of detection of that test. Yeah. So, I mean, less than two is better than, than two, <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's at least that, um, and it might be zero. Um, and the one thing is with the XRF testing, you don't know if those dishes are leaching. There's really no way to know. Uh, yeah. it sounds to me like, I don't know what you described, but is it like salt pottery with a blue and gray glaze? No, it's um, all different patterns and colors. It's hand painted. Um, it's from Johnson City, Tennessee, like from a factory between like the 1930s and the 1950s. They're all hand painted. Um, they're beautiful, of course. And they've been passed down to me from grandma. Um, so, you know. If you want to send me one for testing and writing up a report, I could do that. And then you would have like yours to share with them, like your specific one. If you have one, you could send me. Um, I I just think in in a case like that, I, for, you know, your question, I would bring paper plates. I mean, I would, that's like, that's not a, not a question. And I would let them think I was crazy because um, there's certain ones that are so high lead. Now, I don't know. I'm not familiar with this particular dish set you're talking about, but the one that like, that everyone seems to have is the um, Franciscan. And I don't know if you know Franciscan, but similar is similar to that, but they're all different. Yeah. Like they're all hand painted. So they're all different in 
little ways, but they're floral patterns and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. so the Franciscan apple and the Franciscan cherry and the Franciscan rose are, are kind of like that. And and um, and they are among the highest lead level uh, plates that, that exist. They I've done testing, some of them are 700,000 parts per million lead. Like yeah. it glazes 70% lead and it leaches and it obviously leaches. So it's not like it's on some of these dishes, it's not a perceived uh risk it's a real risk <laughs> yeah and and all these are old so like they have like the cracks and stuff in the glaze i forget what it's called crazy. But crazy crazy they all have crazing on them it's rare to find a plate that doesn't you know they're all chipped like on the edges and you know originally i got the lead testing done one those plates tested positive and two our doors and our door frames in our house tested positive and i have an 11 month old that's crawling. And obviously those are high friction surfaces. Yeah. Um, so, you know, thankfully they still came back. They said under two, I'm also a clean freak. I clean like nobody's business, you know, I vacuum and, you know, eventually if we, if it was in our budget, we would like to replace those things, but it's not right now. So we do know that there's other things in our house that do contain lead. I want to show you. So this is, so we went away for a month um, to do some advocacy overseas, which was a really cool opportunity that I had. And then while we were away, my husband removed all of the trim from all of our doors and all of our windows. So our windows have no trim and <laughs> our doors have no trim and there's, and there's, and there's no doors in most of the doorways. And that was to get rid of the lead and arsenic because I'm like, okay, I'm not living here another day with this lead and arsenic trim with what I know how this is like, how can I live here? How can I live here 15 years with this damn trim? So yeah, I can't afford, we can't afford it either. Uh, we're so we're so broke. I can't even tell you. But um, but the fact of the matter is, you know, I found a way for me with that. And I'm not saying it's not for everyone, but for me, removing the getting out of the house, having my husband do it safely, making sure he did use containment, um, and removing the the trim and um, baseboards and doors that tested positive, not the exterior door. But um, because of that, <laughs> we have yeah. um, and we, we have been pricing that out and we have been talking about me taking our kids away for the weekend and to have my husband do that. It has been on the discussion board because those are high friction areas. And yeah, if you do that, you know, what I tell people is you want to do dust wipe sampling before you come back to make sure there's no hazard. But if you have to just be gone for a weekend and you can't do the dust wipe sampling, you just have to really thoroughly clean everything with white, wet wipes anywhere you think there might have been any dust. And obviously you hope that he puts plastic down and, and moves any furniture out of the room where he's working on anything like this room where I'm in right now was our bedroom, but he moved everything into the other room. And so now we uh, all the furniture was in room, one room and I, and I took over my bedroom as my office because I had nowhere to be <laughs> and, all, and everything's been at this room was completely empty while he worked on it. And then he, we cleaned it like head to toe with um, with the Clorox wipes, like every every surface that was not removed and yeah. we resurfaced the walls, too. So so, you know, it's it's um, it, 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 that's important. Also, do you have rugs in your house carpets? We, we do. We have some area rugs in all the bedrooms in our living room. Um, so you want to make sure to get rid of those. Uh, I mean, actually not get rid of necessarily, but I mean, in the long run, probably better to not have them if you have lead hazards in the house, but definitely while you're doing any work, you want those rolled up and put away, away, you know, in, 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 a, in a room that's not being worked on. And like what my husband did was the room behind me is, is my son's room. And he, he put all the furniture of the upstairs of the house in my son's room, um, both the bedrooms and everything, uh, every piece of furniture was in there. And then he just plastic over that door. So there was no dust could get into that door. And then he did the work on the upstairs um, like that. Yeah, it would, our house is like 650 square feet. So you can stand in the middle and see everything. So it would definitely be like hanging plastic and yeah, you know, like it, it would be Tetris, but we would be able to make it happen. <laughs> yeah. And that's what it was. Um, you, you, you get a pod, you, you know, you could get a container and put everything outside in a container. If it's not um, the wet season or something, you know, you don't have to worry about things getting moldy. I think that that's all, all with the 650 square foot house. That's an easy thing to do. Yeah. Um, so that might be also a good option. Um, I don't know about, you know, so, so, so consider sending me one of the plates if you want, um, yeah. send me a link. I could maybe find one on eBay. I could buy. Oh, um, I can. Oh, I'm, I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do with them yet, but I have, a lot of them. I have thousands of them in my basement. So I will gladly ship you some to test. Send me the pictures first so I can see what they look like. Um, okay. So email me, tamarubin at mac.com is my email address. 
And um, let's see, I, I'm, there's two other people with raised hands. Is that okay? Okay, yeah, yeah thank you. Um, I, and I, I'm trying to figure out this. Let's see, um, Kim, that was you. Um, who's got a raised hand? Does anybody have a raised hand or does somebody have a leftover raised hand? Um, I can't, I'm, I'm like blind, hold on a second. Is, I guess if somebody has, it has a question and I haven't answered your question. Maybe I got it. Maybe I got to everyone. I'm so sorry. Um, Who's that? I don't know if you heard, uh, it's KM. It's my name's actually Carrie. Um, we spoke last time. I just had another question if you didn't mind answering. I'm looking for you. Hold on a second. I'm okay. looking for your video. Are you are you oh uh okay? There I am. Oh, hi. Hi, yeah. Um I, I had another question. Um, so it's just a silly one, I guess, maybe not, but no, you know, your, your, convers <laughs> your conversation today, um, you know, about, you know, different, um, I guess, signs of like lead poisoning. It was really interesting because I would have never made the connection. And I was kind of wondering, you know, other than like the basic couple that you'll find when you Google something, what are some really obscure symptoms of like heavy metal poisoning or lead poisoning that you have found that maybe most people don't know about? That's a good question. Um, well, so so it all gets back to the question we were talking about about um, correlation versus causation, and um, the main thing is that I believe there's causation in some areas where there isn't either established correlation or there's established correlation, but there hasn't been any established causation. So one of the big things that Avi has, my son. Um, who was most acutely poisoned, he has severe plaque psoriasis all over his body. Now, th there isn't any study linking that to lead exposure, but psoriasis takes hold when uh, you have a compromised immune system and your body isn't reacting normally to external stimulus. So for him, if he would get a cut on his hand or on his knee, it would turn into psoriasis that would then you know, spread all over his leg. Um, it started on his feet, actually. He got... Um, you know, when, when you have a baby, um, you get them shoes, right? And you, and, and you don't think about, you can't know what's going to fit them or what they're going to be comfortable with or how it's going to rub because they've never worn shoes before. Well, he started wearing shoes and they created like little calluses on his feet. And then he started getting, he started getting psoriasis anywhere where the shoes touched his feet. Um, so it was like, it was like this reaction to anything touching his body. Um, and then it extended to his fingernails. So his, his, uh, his body saw his fingernails as an intrusion to his fingers and he got psoriasis all over his, his, um, fingernails and, um, and then like, you know, the, 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 the over the cuticles. And then the, the crazy thing was, um, he got psoriasis inside his ears. And so instead of earwax, he has psoriasis in his ears and, and it, it, it causes blockages and, and it's a mess. That's just one. I mean, there's that, that, that we've experienced, uh, um, the, 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 gosh, I've got a couple uh, posts on the website about symptoms, um, but you know, the main symptoms that are acknowledged, the, well, the primary symptom is no symptom at all initially, but then, yeah, uh, saw that. then, you know, headaches and GI issues and arthritic, it, it, like arthritis is well-documented. And that's the other thing, like arthritis and plaque psoriasis are essentially the same disease, the inflammation and the reaction and the same um, mechanism for uh, impairments and disability. So when when people have severe arthritis, they take the same injectable biologic medication that they take if they have um, severe plaque psoriasis. So it's a similar mechanism in the body that's causing those things. And there is it's well documented that, that arthritis is is caused um, by lead exposure. So so they're just, you know, it's about jumping from the leap from arthritis to plaque psoriasis. Shouldn't be that hard, but nobody's done it. But then, you know, the all of the things like ADHD, ADD, those things, uh, attention um, issues and, and uh, cognitive impairments, those are they're pretty well documented. I think um, earlier I was talking about AJ's um, abdominal migraines, and that was a funny one because it took us six months for him to get a diagnosis of abdominal migraines. They 
they wouldn't give us a diagnosis to get him excused from going to school because I just wanted him to be able to go to school for a few hours in the morning when he when he wasn't feeling sick, um, which was like after he had digested his breakfast, but before he got hungry for lunch, he, he had these few hours of functionality and he was in sixth grade, so he was like 11. And, um, and we waited six months to get a diagnosis of abdominal migraines and the doctor didn't even really examine him. She just heard what I had to say and she said, okay, abdominal migraines, here's your pass to not go to school full time. Like, well, what was that? <laughs> you know, that's not, yeah. that's not helpful. And why couldn't you do that over the phone? And why did we have to wait six months for that? So um, I think there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that isn't well understood. And um, like one of the other uh, women was talking about earlier, like she has this whole cluster of symptoms, like the peanut allergies, it's, it's not about the peanut allergy itself, but it's about a body that has um, uh, low tolerance for reactions to um, foreign substances. So with my son, AJ, he doesn't have a peanut allergy, but he has a red food dye allergy, very severe, life-threatening. He, um, he can have you know, significant hives. I, there's, a, there's a post with pictures of him in the hospital with the hives from having um, his girlfriend's bubble tea. Um, which was light pink. So it had very little red food dye in it, but it was enough to just put him in the hospital. So, so th things like that where, you know, people are looking for other causes, but given the prevalence of lead exposure, there's a likely causal link to lead exposure, but, the, but it's just not being, but, but, but most doctors don't know about it. Um, for yeah. many you have a second part of your question or does that, does that help? I don't know if what you're looking for. Uh, no, that was like really helpful. I don't know, in my head I'm thinking like, hmm, wonder what change will come about from like all the work that you're doing. Um, just in my head, I was thinking that while you were talking, listening. Um, no, my other question was just really odd. Um, I just kind of want to know, I didn't see on your website, but, and I don't use them a lot. Um, I'm just curious about essential oils because I see the diffuser, but I don't see anything on essential oils themselves. Um, I, I, I'm pretty, um, well, I, ha I keep a scent free home and, um, and my kids uh, are scent sensitive because of their lead exposure as well. Uh, so they're sensitive to dyes and scents and flavorings, anything like that. And even the so-called natural essential oils can have impurities and non-natural you know, I don't know. I don't know how they, they make them, but, but I haven't yeah. found anything like that, that I felt was, uh, pure enough or, um, non that they didn't cause any compromises. So, so I really, I don't, I'm not a fan. <laughs> I'm not a fan okay. of essential oils. And I've just, I've read, I've done enough reading about them to, to see that they can be pretty toxic. What, what I do like, if I'm going to use an essential oil is, um, is food, food grade. And, and, and unfortunately, there's a lot of people who uh, say that some of the essential oils are food grade when they're not food grade. Um, and the only ones that are food grade are the ones you might actually use as an ingredient in baking. You know, so you might have, um, you know, a, an oil um, based uh, um, orange flavoring or a lemon flavoring or something like that that you can use in baking. And, and, and I had a friend. Oh, I've never heard that. <laughs> yeah. Well, the a fun thing is like, I mean, if you're doing it for perfume, which some people do, uh, a, a friend of mine used to use, you know, baking vanilla for perfume. And I thought that was, that was perfect. Like, you know, it's like, it's food and you're putting it on your body. It can't get any better. Yeah. Um, and I just, I'm pretty strict about that. Um, I just, I just have heard too many horror stories about essential oils. And I know a lot of people really invested a lot of time, energy, and, and thought into making those choices, but I, I haven't, I haven't felt confident about any of the, the companies um, in that industry enough to feel like that it's not all snake oil. Oh, no, fair enough. Um, I was just curious. Um, and I don't see anywhere, where's your like Venmo or oh. <laughs> it might be somewhere, but I just, Thank you. I don't know, maybe I missed yeah. it. So um, if, there, if you look up on the, um, it's on the homepage of the website. Oh, yeah, on the homepage. There's there's a there's a post that says ways to help ways to support the work and it's got cherry blossoms but oh, yeah. um, I really appreciate that um, the Venmo is um, and it all goes to let's save Mama LLC but it's at, at Tamara E Rubin and then the three digits are three one eight two and then um, the Zelle is five zero three seven zero two two seven zero eight and then the PayPal is Tamara Rubin at mac.com. I I, oh, I 
I, I really like right now, the finances of the business of what I'm doing are very low. Uh, so anything that anyone wants to contribute is welcome. But um, I'm really hopeful that this is the year that that the business is going to be self-sustaining. Like to that, tonight, I went to uh, Starbucks. I went to take my friend's dog for a walk. And um, and I saw a mug there that I wanted to buy that that obviously has lead paint on it. I mean, it must be lead paint. And I'm like, oh, I gotta buy this mug and test it. But I couldn't because I didn't have any money left. Um, and it's like 20 bucks. But you know, when I get paid next month, I'll be able to buy it. But um, you know, it's just like, I've been doing a lot of, instead of having people send me things, let me, let me show you like, um, well, and, and people have, people have chipped in, you know, people chipped in to help me buy this set of knives and, um, and I have to test them. I'm looking forward to testing these. I'm assuming they're coated in titanium dioxide paint, but I'm not sure, but I've been, I've been kind of trying to, um, balance out the antiques and vintage stuff with, with things that, that people want, um, tested that are new and available. And, um, I, it's 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 fascinating to me. Um, you know, I I shared about these these my friend. Hold on one second. My friend Carissa gave me these. I went over to Carissa's house, and uh, she had just she was had her Christmas stuff off and I uh, up and I posted about these on um, Instagram. And yeah. one of these, so these I'm like, well, I didn't have to buy these. I have another bunch of Christmas stuff, but she she gave them to me, and two of them test positive for lead. I think this one this is the one that's positive for mercury and arsenic. Wow, you know, so it, it, it's not going to poison you, um, but you know, people need to know that Christmas ornaments have things like mercury and arsenic. So, so I, so the point being, I don't know where I'm, I'm rambling, but I just, um, I like, I, I'm, I'm trying to test more new things that people, people want tested, and 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 I also am trying to pay down the twelve thousand dollars to, um, for the refurbishment of the of the instrument. So I really appreciate that you asked. <laughs> No, no. Um, I appreciate you um, having these Zoom meetings and answering all our questions. So, so at least, uh, you know, I could do is give back. Thank you. Thank you. I think yours was the last question. I don't think there's any other questions. Um, um, did you have another one before you go? Uh, no, no. That was okay. it. Thank you. I'm going to unpin you then. Okay, well, thanks everybody for doing this. We went a little bit over. That's what happened last time, an hour and 40 minutes instead of an hour. And I really appreciate that everyone took the time. And um, I'll be posting this on YouTube and sharing it in the group. Um, and thanks. And I'll probably do this again uh, in a couple of days when I have uh, some time on the road. I'm headed to New York to help families on the 18th. And then I'm going to be back on the 28th. And then I'm headed to um California after that okay thanks Thank everyone you see you later <laughs> hi Sarah <laughs> I'll call you I'll call you tonight bye-bye <laughs>